Okay, let's see if it picks up. Hello? Uh -huh. Hey, Paul Martino. Yeah, what's up? John Furrier, you're on the Silicon Valley Friday show with Jeff Frick and my guest, Tom Joyce, former executive at EMC, HP Dell, looking for work, talking to VCs. Hey, you got uh, you got a second? Uh, long time no see, Furrier. I appreciate the call. <laughs> okay, what's going on? So we're just highlighting Bullpen Capital as the VC of the week, talking about how cool you are. Uh, and uh, your firm's doing a great job. We had some critique on you, be talk behind your back, but you can check that out later. Um, <laughs> All right, wow, well, I'm glad I picked up the phone. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's that's why we're going to make it up to you. So, Paul, look, at, I just want to just get you on because we've been talking about the election as well, all, all in the intros, that's pretty much the news. I did kind of weave in the, the, one of the big things that happened this week was overshadowed by that was my one-on-one -on -one with Andy Jassy up in Seattle this week for two hour exclusive interview, um, not videotape, but it was gonna come out on a post about this massive disruption we're seeing right now. I mean, the election points to it. I've been watching your Facebook feed. You called it, you've been seeing the trends. You grew up in Bucks County, which calls all the elections. You had a good sense of this. And you know, as an investor, you've made some good bets too. What's your take on this? I mean, where did, you, where did you see the action coming from that gave you the indication that this was possible? Yeah, so look, at heart, at heart, I am more contrarian than anything. People say, are you a liberal, are you a conservative, that kind of stuff. But really, if I can ascribe to an ideology, it's contrarian. And so clearly, from a Silicon Valley perspective, the Trump election is as contrarian as it could have possibly been. But if you were looking at the data with kind of a dispassionate set of eyes, you could absolutely see that this could have happened. So I actually wrote to my partners the day of the election. I said, look, I, I, I've been crunching the models. And it, I, John, I know you know this background, but I'm a high performance computing and predictive modeling guy. So big data. I did my PhD work in that. This is the world I come from. So I sent the, the following note to my partners the day of the election. I said, look, I think the trading markets have this wrong. I think Trump's about a one in three shot. I think Hillary is in the lead, but he's about a one in three shot. And oh, by the way, if he wins, he's going to with over 300 electoral votes because the Rust Belt is going to vote in a correlated way. And so that's basically the letter I said to my guys. And my guys then, of course, you know, once the election happened, said, how come nobody else anywhere sent a note like this? And literally, I mean, you read the pundits, yeah. you read Huffington Post, not a single person said that. And I don't think it was that I was so much smarter than the other people. I think I was able to check my biases at the door and just look at the data, which, oh, by the way, is the same kind of way we pick our, our companies at Bullpen. Hey, uh, Paul, Jeff Frick here. Question for you. You would think after Trump went from last place out of 17 people, uh, to win the Republican um, candidacy that maybe people would have said, you know, he's not such a long shot as it may appear on the surface. But that didn't seem to factor in at all. Absolutely right. And you know what? The one guy who actually saw that and, and apologized to some extent was then Tillery Port. So Nate Silver, he basically <clears throat> got the Trump uh, primary totally wrong. He said, my bad. And then, even though he's a bit on the left, he started looking more at the data. And the weekend before the election, he had Trump as a, almost the same number I did. He had Trump at about 35%. But he was pillory. The guy from the Huffington Post goes, Nate Silver, you're being irresponsible. He is at most a 1% to 2% chance to win. And every other model's got, got a 90% plus. What the hell is wrong with you? And, and he bent and he cowed to it. And then he changed his model to about 16 18% the day of the election. Paul. But, but it's funny. You can almost see that he had it right and he didn't have the courage to stick with it. This is about uh, the courage. Again, putting all the biases at the door. I love how you said that because, again, I was the same way because, you know, I live in Silicon Valley. And, you know, I'm from the party of business. That's I'm, I'm, I guess I'm kind of a contrarian too, but I'm a, I'm a blue collar guy myself. Um, and I like to check my bias at the door because I don't like to make a bet. I'm in the party of business. I want to, I want to make money. I want to grow and things. So, so I got to get your take on this. I mean, this is about the media failure. We have a seven year old self-funded media business, Silicon Angle Media, 35 employees and growing, kicking ass, taking names again, yep. contrarian, true, but the media fail here is an epic fail, in my opinion. You point out some of the biases. I mean, I just saw this morning Trump, uh, I mean, CNN had a, a, a staged interview with protesters. I mean, the, the bias on the media here has been out of control. And you looked at the data as if you were a reporter. Now, you're not. You're just you're in the investment business. But this was a media fail. Your thoughts on that? I know you've been sharing some links. Uh, I, John, I couldn't agree with you more. And I know you and I have, have gone back and forth on various Facebook posts about this. Uh, and what's really funny now in the aftermath, you had about half the journalists who were wrong write a, 
God, what was I, you know, uh, a wake up, I, I need to get out of my bubble. And, you know, I must admit, I really appreciate that. The, the, the people who said, you know, us being all in for Hillary, being in our own bubble was really a problem. But, you know, it scares me, and then we'll get to why the bias happened. There's this other half of them that doubled down. I mean, to me, there's now a portion of the press that is completely hopeless. You know, the editor of The New Yorker writes this article at 2.40 in the morning after it happened, which was basically like, you know, all these awful people in the country made this happen. You know, everybody go to hell, basically. You know, but other people, the guy from CBS yesterday wrote an article basically saying, hey, you know, we had a systematic failure here. We better, we better look at ourselves as to why this happened, how we let this happen. You know, maybe making fun of those people in the, in the Midwest who had lost their jobs, were struggling with drug addiction, and had no hope, saying, check your white privilege at the door. Maybe that wasn't the best strategy for reaching out to them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. And, and again, this, the, the impact, though, also is, is, is catastrophic. And we were talking last week on our show about the WikiLeaks. And, and I said to Jeff, not one of those WikiLeaks has been debunked, meaning no one's come out and said they've been doctored. But it brought up a different issue, which is now getting back to data science and data. We're now living in a social network. You started one of the first social networks. Now, you know, I was saying earlier, giving you props that you're like the, the Reed Hoffman that nobody knows. You're out there. You've been a pioneer and a contrarian and successful. But if you look at the data, right, if you look at this and say, where's the data? Okay, that is the, the key right now. And so the impact of WikiLeaks was there wasn't a smoking gun, but the data was was reinforcing what what you were saying around people's perceptions. So this is going to not just be for politics, Paul. This is going to impact a lot of things. And I know you funded FanDuel, which was a really radical approach with kicking ass and the betting systems and all these kind of social technologies. What does this mean for technology intersecting with social justice and social good and political science? Your thoughts on that? Right. So, so look, obviously getting hacked is not exactly a great outcome, but getting hacked has led to a level of transparency that should have otherwise been available to us. And I think that's what the lesson is going to be. The lesson is going to be, if you know that you can get hacked, or if you know that there's cameras, or you know that there's a world in which information is way more readily available than you think it is, which maybe it is. being transparent about what you're up to is the only viable strategy forward going. I mean, we adopt this as our strategy right on our website. Uh, we put on our website, here's the three things you need if you're going to be a bullpen company. Here's how we pick our companies. I can't tell you the number of people said to me, well, Paul, isn't that your secret sauce? Isn't that the proprietary technology? I'm like, yeah, it is, but I'm going to tell you what it is. And if you think you're better at it than me, go right ahead and try and do it. You know, I just, I just think that if it's got to be proprietary what you're doing, in the long run, your advantage just does not exist. If you can't tell them what you're doing and do it because you're better than them, you've got, you, you got, you got a really hard future in the new world. Yeah, Paul, we're going to come back on break. We're going to hold you on the line, but that's exactly what Andy Jassy and I were talking about. Open always wins. Open always wins. And scale matters. And, you know, and, and having the best product. That's Paul Martino on the phone. He's going to stay on with us. We're going to take a short break right now on uh, to go to our sponsors. We'll be right back with more after the short break with Paul Martino, Jeff Frick, and Tom Joyce. Great conversation. Paul, stay on the line. We'll be right back. Since the dawn of big data, awesome. the Cube has been there. Connected with executives, practitioners, entrepreneurs, Thought leaders. But you're not a thought leader anymore, you're a futurist. That's the new trend. Futurist is the buzzword. No, I'm not. I'm, I'm very much living in the past. <laughs> I don't like the future. And I don't think much of the present. And John Cleese. There's, there's a whole lot of people out there who have no idea what they're doing, but they have absolutely no idea that they have no idea what they're doing. And those are the ones with the confidence of stupidity who finish up in power. That's why the planet doesn't work knowledgeable, insightful, and a true gentleman. And the guy at the counter recognized me and said, are you listening? Yes, I'm tweeting away. So you're not I tweet, tweet. I'm tweeting away. He is kind of rude that way, but. keyboard. <laughs> John Cleese joins the Cube alumni. Welcome, John. You got any phone calls you need to answer? Hold on, let me check. The Cube is a comfortable place. You come inside the Cube and we have a conversation, uh, almost as if it were a, a, a chance meeting. And we have a, a discussion about a particular topic. Our philosophy is everybody's expert at something. Everybody's passionate about something and has real deep knowledge about that something. Well, we want to focus in on that area 
and extract that knowledge and share it with our community. So folks who have never heard of it before come in the Cube and say, wow, this is really cool what you guys are doing. It's unique, it adds value to the community, and it adds value by really sharing information. I can't tell you how many people stop me at conferences or on the streets, on our airports, say, hey, I love your show. People that I've never met before, they say to me, I know you, you don't know me. I watch the Cube, I queue up your videos, I listen to them while I'm on the, the treadmill. You know, it helps me, you know, learn, expands my knowledge, you know, thank you. So, you know, it's really an honor to be part of that community. This is Dave Vellante. Thanks for watching The Cube. You're listening to the Silicon Valley Friday Show with John Furrier. And Seth. <laughs> You listen to the Silicon Valley Friday Show. I'm John Furrier, and joining me today is Jeff Frick and Tom Joyce, and special call-in VC of the week, Paul Martino, who picked up. And when the benefit of picking up is we don't trash you behind your back, <laughs> uh, and we get some commentary. Yep. Paul, thanks for spending the time. We appreciate it uh, coming on. Appreciate that. Very good. Thank you. Uh, we just we had a great commentary in that last segment around the impacted election, and, and you know, really appreciate your commentary as. Uh, uh, a, a geek in data analytics, and you get your PhD in this area, high-scale computing. Um, now I want to talk about the impact in, uh, of technology. Obviously, the election behind us. The, the game has certainly changed. The trajectory of our country is going to be shifting. And you know, I always said to people on Facebook, if you don't get involved, you're part of the problem, not the solution. So you know, it's an opportunity to let Trump go do his thing. We'll keep a critical eye on him, certainly with SiliconANGLE. But more importantly, it's game on for a new trajectory, and we're going to see how it plays out. But the impacts... Um, are unknown, and certainly there will be impact on Silicon Valley, there's going to be impact on technology, there's going to be an impact on ratings, which we touched on. Guys, let's talk about this segment, the impact on uh, Silicon Valley, technology, globalization. Paul's on the East Coast in, in Philly. Um, we're here in Silicon Valley in our little bubble that's now been busted up. Um, <laughs> It's a global, the world is flat. I saw Thomas Friedman at the IBM event, you know, and, and we, we, this is now happening. Thoughts? Yeah, nothing, nothing is safe. I mean, John, you said the right word. The Silicon Valley bubble has been popped in this regard, and I don't think anything healthier could have happened than that. Uh, I post One of the things I posted on my webpage once this happened, kind of out, out to my friends in Silicon Valley, I said, you got to remember the, the Mike Tyson quote, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. <laughs> and to some extent, it's once you get punched in the mouth, once you get your bubble burst, once you realize that there's other world around you, the way you behave in these situations really tells you who you are. As an investor and board member, it's in a situation like this, I want to see how my CEO operates now. When everything's hunky-dory, great, up and to the right, you know, you definitely have a different person than when you're in a spot where you got punched in the face. So I'm, I'm actually quite interested to see how a lot of disillusioned and upset Silicon Valley CEOs operate now that they realize there is another world out there. Yeah, it's a great point. Tom Joyce was actually t commenting on our opening segment that, you know, a lot of the young kids who are protesting never lost before or seen it, an epic loss before. And he was commenting, we have, Paul, you were talking about, I, I mean, Tom, you were talking about that notion of just getting back to work versus all the cuddling going on. People are sending memos out saying, it's okay, like it's a tragedy, an, an election in a democracy was a tragedy. And, and, and all this cuddling at all these the universities, it's ridiculous. Like, like it's an election, this is how the system works. It's a land of laws, you might not like it, but get up and get involved. Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, I, I, we all, I have kids, right? You know, the first instinct is, all right, how do I explain this to my kid who's sitting next to me and the other one's in college at a big party to celebrate Hillary Clinton, right? They haven't experienced this before, but, the next day I realized, well, what am I going to do? I'm going to go to work and I'm going to do my job and I'm going to figure out how to play this. And I'm going to watch closely. And the message to them is kind of go to school because, I mean, frankly, Mondale didn't win. Dukakis didn't win. And the, the country went on. And yeah, I'll tell you what pisses me off the most, to be honest with you, no matter what side you are on. The people who are saying, I'm going to go to Canada, that's BS. You know, you're either you're an American, you're a patriot or you're not. And, you know, we all ha kind of have to pull our bootstraps up and, and get going forward. And I think, you know, the comment about the entrepreneurs is key. I mean, day one after the market fell apart in 2008, I was sitting in a startup that couldn't raise money. All right, what do I do now? And this yeah. isn't that bad. It's adversity. It's, it's dealing right, with the dynamic right. nature similar. of the world. I mean, this is the disruption. So the disruption, What do I do now? To Paul's point is how you act will define who you are as a person and a leader. 
And so, Paul, what's your what's your take on that? I mean, what do you advise? Well, I saw... I'll tell you one thing. I will tell you one thing that upset me a couple of years ago and really upset me yesterday. And I think this is something everybody, left, right, center, contrarian, not contrarian, FOMO guy in Silicon Valley needs to, to get on board with. In the Grubhub CEO comes out and basically says, hey, look, you know, you Trump supporters, uh, you know, you can feel free to resign. And if you guys remember what happened to the CEO of Mozilla a couple years ago because of a campaign contribution, a campaign contribution to a stance that the then President Obama had. He was, he was ousted by his board as the result of a political contribution. And the Grubhub CEO, and it's unclear how explicit he was about saying Trump supporters need to resign from my company. We need to all get together and say that behavior is unacceptable. That is un-American. That is un-Silicon Valley. That is un-meritocracy. Uh, you know, we, we, we need to make sure we embrace everyone. We talk about diversity. Well, what about diversity of political opinion? That's got to be on the list, too. And I, I, I'm really strong on this topic. I will not tolerate that from my CEOs. I don't think anybody in Silicon Valley should tolerate a thought police firing people because of who they voted for. You know, that's exactly the, the – you know what? You brought up a good point, and that was Derek Elitch or E-H or whatever he's, a, but he also invented JavaScript. So it's not like he was just like some suit. The guy was a player. And by the way, he donated 10 grand, which is in the scheme of things is like, like pennies these days, right? It's 10 grand. It's like, you know, writing a check to, to uh, you know, anybody. I mean, yeah. the guy from Facebook donated $34 million to have Hillary elected. $34 million. Yeah, the so, thing that, that gets me is, is I think, Paul, what you touched on is we've lost the ability to have civil discourse with difference of opinions and have a conversation about it and agree to disagree. And now it becomes this inflated thing regardless of the size. Yeah, but the double we've, standard, we've lost that. Well, that's, the double that's standard is brutal. He's talking about a double standard. He's Absolutely. talking about people who play the diversity card uh, in an angry way, but yet don't balance it out on the other side. And that's what the journalists didn't do either. I and mean, this is a huge issue, this whole you know, Mozilla guy and then the Grubhub, whatever his name is. Uh, I just heard rumblings about that. It's unacceptable. It doesn't foster any collaboration. It just separates and creates silos and and more less transparent environment i mean that's to me huge issue paul thoughts yeah boy, when you can live in your own echo chamber this is what can happen you know i've had some of our ceos raise really big rounds ahead of milestones and the, i have this very special conversation with those ceos the day you believe what you're worth is the result of this financing, I'm going to put my foot in your you-know-what. <laughs> and I'm going to be the guy calling you out every single day when you start believing your own BS. And, and you know what? I think that's a real service to do to those CEOs. For example, in a hot company, as it's up and to the right and everything is perfect, you need somebody in the room saying, hey, maybe everything isn't so perfect or maybe all this data isn't so good. I talked to a friend of mine who was a Democrat strategist here in Pennsylvania yesterday, and he said a lot of the ads that were run here in Pennsylvania were explicitly directed at women, explicitly directed at the gauche behavior of Donald Trump. And, and he said at one of the meetings, he said, you know, maybe we should make some ads to talk to the men of Pennsylvania, too. Maybe we should make some ads talking about Mike Pence and his positions. And they all said, no, get out of the room. We don't need that opinion. We're going to stick with this strategy. You know, we don't need you in this meeting. That's the kind of behavior that, that potentially calls for in the campaign because Pennsylvania was so important. That's the kind of behavior when I see it in my startups, I get yeah. furious at the CEO for enabling to happen. Paul, so let's talk about venture capital and funding in the, the marketplace and media. Obviously, Jeff and, and I have been riffing on the NFL ratings going down. This all points to a couple of disruptions going on. One is new opportunity, new entrants entering the market. You funded FanDuel, seed financing. Um, there's a lot of other competition for NFL, people are on Snapchat 24-7, Mindshare and other things. Thoughts on investing in this disruption and your thoughts on the NFL ratings? Well, so first half, there, is, there are always disruptions inside of our ecosystem. The, the level of groupthink and venture capital as a whole is very similar to the level of groupthink in Silicon Valley. And so there are always contrarian opportunities in venture capital, either by looking at out-of-favor categories, companies in out-of-favor geographies, or looking at founders with non-traditional backgrounds. You go look at all of the really successful stuff in our portfolio. Husband and wife team starts a fantasy sports company in Edinburgh, Scotland. That's called FanDuel. 
uh, you know, uh, a talent scout and a cocktail waitress form a cosmetics company. That's Ipsy. Right? These are our best companies. Companies formed in L.A. and Edinburgh by people with not exactly the traditional kinds of background. Yeah. And you know what's, what's common about these companies is a lot of other venture people didn't give them the right time of day because they didn't fit the pattern. Uh, and, you know, we just capitalize on the fact that those kind of built-in biases are across the system. Yeah. So what do you want to know about uh, the NFL? How can I help you on that one? Well, John? first of all, we believe in the contrarian. We're, we're a media company founded by people who had no media degrees of any kind. Um, but uh, NFL has been talking about... <laughs> By your standard, we're, we're, we're still an outlier, though. We're still contrarian. Um, outliers are key. Obviously, that's a success. We've seen that. NFL is not an outlier. They've been doubling down on their their billion dollars. Certainly, I'm a Tom Brady fan, so I, I am not a big uh, NFL fan. But the ratings are down, and they're scratching their head going, what the hell's going on? They blame on? the election. They blame baseball. There's a lot of blame. But all those excuses are gone, and I don't think it's going to change. Is it, a, is it a condition of just uh, uh, attention, or is there, is there underlying causes to this, your opinion? So, so I've, I've been able to see data on this as a result of being involved with FanDuel. And so I'm not on the board any longer, but of course I still stay in touch with the companies. And when you have that kind of exposure to the asset, which FanDuel does as a result of its, uh, of its uh, product, certainly you see, see data. And we saw this immediately, and this trend of viewership, it did not change from weeks one to nine. You know, if this was the first week or two was a blip, you'd, you'd think one thing. But this is now nine, ten weeks straight. And, and I think there are two reasons that the NFL is somewhat unwilling to admit is behind this. Oh, it's the election. Oh, it's sector. Oh, the baseball was really good this year. I think that's, I think that's not right. I think there's a real change in the quality of the product because of parity brought to the league. And oh, dare I say this, maybe it's safer to say now, the Colin Kaepernick protest turned off a lot of people probably in that rust belt that voted for Donald Trump. Call me crazy. <laughs> Well, too, well, you know, yeah, I, mean, I was going to say, look, go just the, the, the consumption patterns, to me, it seems like it's That's kind of, it's bipolar, right? You're either totally into your fantasy and you watch your app and you watch your guy score points throughout the day, or you go to Red Zone. Why would I go to Fox or CBS or NBC when I can watch Red Zone commercial free? Well, I, th I think there's that. And, you know, I think the other thing is my, my, my son and all his friends, they play football. My son's the captain of the football team, plays every down, doesn't watch football on TV, doesn't watch anything on TV. They can't get him to watch TV. Why is that? Just because he's distracted? That's not the medium they consume things right. through anymore. They just don't want to do it. They don't want to sit in one They're room cord and cutters. watch TV. Right, They've right. cut the cord. And, you know, it's funny to me, just to, just to say, knowing nothing about this and having no data, the, the folks that were ahead of it were like world wrestling. You know, they were using the technology early. The NFL's not, they've been beholden to the well, old Paul, model. He, Paul, well, Paul brings up the point right. about the so Kaepernick. The, the anyway. Kaepernick reinforces the, the vibe, which is, I want entertainment, I love football, I don't want politics jammed down my throat. Well, I think that's I mean, a that, big that, factor that, that is short term. A, it might not be the, the reason, but I think he might be right on this, that you know whether you agree with him or not, he this is an issue. Wait, wait a minute, I want to watch football, not some bullshit <laughs> media <laughs> thing. I mean, that's a, I mean, one of the virtues of sports, and oh, by the way, let's talk about how good esports is and all the stuff you just said the NFL is not good at. Esports. I yeah. was at the League of Legends semifinal, and the final was in New York just, just a couple weeks ago. They built this for a millennial audience. They understood the medium in the way that UFC and WWE did. And, and the NFL, since they make so much money on broadcast linear television, they're stuck with it's it. It's difficult. They're the one that's going to get disrupted because they're the incumbent. The newcomers can disrupt them with the new mediums. But you talk to people who are 16, 18 years old, they've never watched a game from beginning to end. They'll, they'll go watch all the clips and talk about all the plays, but they didn't watch the game end end. So it's more than cord cutting. It's actually the way in which it's consumed. I think that's right. It's yeah. completely fantasy. non-linear fantasy. fantasy. It's fantasy. All this points to the right. friggin' non-linear. Yeah, so if the, if the Colin Kaepernick thing goes away, right, I don't think the dynamic changes. No, I think they I have a fundamental well, long-term problem. I think, it's, I think it's like WikiLeaks. It's not a smoking gun, but it's a reinforcement of the, the core audience, which is like people who aren't on. So I think that's one. No, yeah. I'm just got, what I'm getting at is I think they had erosion at both the young and the old side. Yeah. There was an erosion at the young side for all of the <laughs> primary reasons that we're talking about, but there was an erosion of people at the more 65 and up Rust Belt area because of the following, and that's why the drop was perhaps as, as precipitous as it was. If it was one of the others, maybe it'd be down a few points, but the fact that they lost younger and older people all at the same time, that's surprising. And if you look, the drop in demographics is across the board. 
board as opposed to just the young people. And that's also why maybe the quality of the product and the parity in the league is something to look at as well. Paul Martino, thanks for, for uh, taking the call and, and really riffing with us. Really appreciate the commentary and all insight was phenomenal. And, and the obviously discussions, the impact be great. Love to bring you back for another segment. I wanted to talk about the blue collar entrepreneurship trend that's going on that we talked about last week. We have to do that another time. Thanks so much for, for, for picking up. Appreciate it. Pleasure being on with all of you. Thank you for the time. All right.